the, the women's struggle for equality and the way forward. Okay. So we wanted to talk a little bit about um, what happened after the women's march, and a lot of people were asking, you know, kind of what now. So when I was looking around for the answer to what now, um, for me there were, um, you know, people had a lot of interesting ideas, but they kind of went in a lot of different directions, and there's a lot of things coming at us at once. So I thought I would try to collect something that looked like more of a structural uh, path on the kind of road that we could take to, um, you know, put together a plan for uh, women's equality. Obviously, this is just my interpretation, but um, I hope you guys find this interesting. So uh, the massive worldwide women's march showed that interest in women's equality is an all-time high. And there's never been a better time to take advantage of the momentum to further the cause. Um, some also might wonder now, what next? And in an age when attacks seem to be coming every day, uh, how do we prioritize which issues that we can work on in regards to women's equality? And how can you and I get involved? And also we can talk a little bit about what is women's equality, um, and maybe a little bit on how we will even know when we've achieved it. We can discuss that. Okay, I love this slide. <laughs> so we're going to fight like a girl. Okay. So when we're talking about what hinders equality for women and what we can do, uh, first let's talk a little bit about what inequality for women looks like. So gender oppression manifests itself in social, economic, and political oppression. And there are several arenas where we should struggle against misogyny as it has a structural presence in our entire society. And things like voting rights, women's health, uh, reproductive rights, and economic equality, or rather inequality, are all main areas that will be under attack with the present administration. And of course, that's not a complete list. There are several other arenas that are linked to climate change, domestic violence, our labor rights, and immigration. And it's really important when we talk about these issues to really bring up women's voices. So the views of women when we do this work in any of these areas will be really crucial to the resistance. The oppression of women isn't just limited to gender, but is also enhanced by other forms of oppression. These can include and can be combined with race, age, orientation, disability, gender identity, and of course class. The examination of the special problems of women must also take into account where oppression may be occurring that isn't often visible. So listening to the experience of women in these identities is crucial. So try to go outside your political silo and gain a variety of viewpoints. Okay. The threat to women's equality under the Trump administration is the clear and present danger. Let's look at how. Okay. Recognizing the misogynistic basis of Trumpism isn't difficult when you look at what targets have been under heavy fire in the administration's first 100 days. And this, of course, is not a complete list by any means. So there's the <clears throat> threat to defund Planned Parenthood. There's an indication that the Violence Against Women Act will not be renewed and grants that protect against domestic violence will be eliminated. Undocumented women have already been withdrawing charges of domestic violence out of fear of deportation, which has already happened to one woman. So attacks on the Affordable Care Act will also result in stripping away benefits and protections for women's health care. Transgender so-called bathroom bills and attacks on transgender children in schools. There's the threat to eliminate head of household tax filing status, which will really target single women with children. And there's a threat to separate mothers from their children at the border, and deportations are also already separating families and mothers from their children. And of course, attacks on the social safety net will impoverish already vulnerable aging women, which is one of the poorest sectors of the United States. Okay, here's a wonderful poster from the Women's March, one of my favorites. 
So I thought I'd include that. Okay, so all of these threats uh, must be fought as they emerge in the short term. Um, you and I personally, of course, can't and don't need to work on every single one of them as I can spread you too thin and can feel really stressful. But you can see if there's an organic way to fold in some of the work for women's equality along with work that you already do. Um, maybe working on an issue that may not affect you directly, but you can relate to your work. But in addition to those kinds of things, we should think of a structural approach for the long term uh, to gain solid protections that will make us less vulnerable to a wide-scale array of attacks on our equality. Uh, many of these issues are problems now because the underlying basis for their existence has never been addressed. And so here are three key areas where we can exert pressure that I believe would have long-term effects. Uh, there's restoring the Voting Rights Act, uh, ratifying the uh, Equal Rights Amendment, and looking forward to election 2018. Okay, so when we're talking about restoring the Voting Rights Act, um, what are we thinking about? What are we looking at? So this is going to take a congressional action in face of the fact that the Supreme Court stripped out the protections for the Voting Rights Act. And although there has been bipartisan support for the Voting Rights Amendment Act, uh, no hearings for this bill have been scheduled. And so this no doubt means we're going to have to change the balance of power to get a hearing for this bill. And one of the ways we can do this is contacting your member of Congress or your senator and tell them that you support getting this process started. And this is why I think this is a key link in this chain. Okay more women vote and more women of color vote for more progressive candidates uh, as witnessed in the 2016 elections. Uh, black and Latino people are more supportive in polling for issues like socialism will, which will include many women voters who already have a track record of progressive voting in conscious coalitions. Uh, it's been found repeatedly in studies that restrictive voter ID laws uh, prevent minorities from voting course, you know that, that's what they're for. And also what goes hand in hand is restricting minorities from voting creates a more conservative electorate. So we're more likely to get reactionary laws and politicians. So fighting against racist road, voter suppression should be a top priority on the road to the 2018 elections, um, as well as pushing your support into organizations that work to expand access for women and women of color and all women in the midterm elections. Okay, and this is an interesting chart I found recently. Um, since women have gained the right to vote, uh, you can see in this bar in the middle here, on this graph, there's kind of this T bar, right where this uh, joins in here, where that line starts to go up on the side, that is where women started to gain the right to vote. And as women uh, gain the right to vote, they started voting for a greater expansion of the social safety net. So having women uh, and more women who are able to have access to the vote really expands the kind of work that we can do in reform. Okay. So the next key issue is ratifying the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, this has been on the back burner for a long time, but it's recently, uh, in light of what's happened in the 2016 elections, has uh, regained new life. Um, the path to this is what's called the three state strategy. It's the path forward there for the ERA ratification. That's because we need three more states to sign on to ratify in order to um, create the opportunity for the Equal Rights Amendment. So just this week, the Nevada State Senate um, just ratified this in one chamber, and it's moving to their state assembly. And we need two more states, um, Illinois, actually, and Virginia are considered good candidates for the next two, because each have passed it in one of their state chambers. So all they need to do is move it to the other chamber and pass it. So if you're in those states, hint, hint, Pressure your state assembly member to take a vote on it and pass ratification. Um, one barrier to this is there was a deadline that was put on the Equal Rights Amendment in 1982 um, 
to, to stop the process. Now, this is pretty unprecedented. Usually there's not that kind of deadline on a, an amendment to the Constitution. So um, Tammy Baldwin and uh, Jackie Spear, I believe, they have a bill in Congress to nullify that 1982 deadline uh, that was passed several years ago to stop the process from going forward. So that's another way you can pressure your member of Congress to sponsor the bill and move the bill to the floor and to create energy around getting that moving. Okay, so a reason why that's important is that obviously the Supreme Court was a big issue in this election and we had a seat stolen from us and we're facing the possible placement of a reactionary Supreme Court uh, member to replace Scalia. Um, one thing with Scalia is that he considered himself a constitutional originalist. So what that means is that as, um, since we don't have an equal rights amendment, that means that it can be interpreted, the U.S. Constitution can be interpreted to mean that discrimination against women on the basis of sex still has theoretical support in the law. So it's not discriminatory to make laws that affect women. So. Um, and just or Judge Gorsuch, um, he really feels that he's in the Scalia mold, and he also feels comfortable with this interpretation of the Constitution as it now stands, which could be really dangerous for us because he is young. Okay. Okay. So we'll move on to the third one. We're talking a little bit about the elections in general and election 2018, which I'm sure is on everyone's radar. So uh, one thing we can do is support efforts to overturn the GOP gerrymandering of districts, which is a huge issue. A lot of the reasons why we've lost seats over the years. Uh, President Obama and former Attorney General Eric Holder are actually leading the fight on redistricting, which will take place in 2020 with a new census. And they have a website now called uh, democraticredistricting.com. I checked it out and I didn't see like a lot of detail yet, but they're kind of in the stay tuned mode. So if you want to check it out and see, get on their mailing list and find out um, what they're going to need. Um, of course, we can get started now by um, thinking about how we're going to participate in the midterm elections. And there's been several groups that have swung up since that have sprouted up since the 2016 elections. There's groups like Swing Left and other groups that are planning to expand the House and the Senate towards the Dems by targeting vulnerable um, GOP seats. And of course, we should always elect more women. Okay, so this is kind of a crunchy slide, but um, there's a lot of like details coming up in the 2011. 18 elections that I think are really important. So the first one is kind of bad news for us is that 10 Democratic senators are up for re-election in states that were carried for Trump. So um, they're going into kind of a, um, a headwind or a, yeah headwind. Um, this is going to be a heavy lift, especially since this will this election is going to come up before any attempt at redistricting in 2020. Um, the DCCC is targeting 59 House GOP members to attempt to unseat them. Uh, California, where I live, is targeting seven vulnerable GOP House Democrats from our state, including Daryl Issa, who only won his seat by 1%. Uh, of course, on the other hand, the GOP has a list of 36 Dem seats that they're looking to flip, so we have to keep our eye on them, too. Um, despite that heavy lift, um, interesting developments since the Women's March include that 4,000 women have contacted EMILY's List, um, organized to get women to run for office, and 4,000 women have signed up to find out how to run for office. So women in general make up a very small proportion of our elected officials, and women of color are also currently underrepresented in office, so uh, it would be great to see um, if we could expand that. And Emily's list said they have never seen such an outpouring of interest. They said it was just like 200% like higher than in a year uh, that people have contacted them to find out how to run for office. And then I'd like to just take a moment to acknowledge some of the wonderful women who are already in office who have been leading the charge and the resistance, including Maxine Waters, uh, Kamala Harris, my new senator in California, uh, Kristen Gillibrand, 
and Elizabeth Warren, she persisted. And uh, we can note that two women on the GOP side have also broken ranks with their party, uh, Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski, on voting against some of the um, really toxic cabinet members. So those are uh, maybe some allies that we can try to uh, cultivate for the future. Okay. So in conclusion, these three interlocking structural changes would make great strides in the women's struggle for equality. And in my opinion, this is kind of how they would do that. So if we restore the Voting Rights Act, we protect voting rights and expand the pool of women voters. And if we ratify the ERA, this is going to make profound structural changes to the law to give women fundamental rights of protection that we don't have right now. And if we can expand our base in 2018, that will expand our power base of resistance and um, protect our reforms via allied lawmakers. So that's my conclusion. So let's see if I can get back to the camera without breaking anything. Oops. Okay. Do you see me? Yes, we do. See you fine. Actually, we were able to see you the whole time through. Oh, okay. Good. <laughs> I can see you, so good. All right, it worked. <clears throat> so that's the end. Okay, well, thank you very much, Michelle. All right. Time? Thank you guys for your patience. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody have a question? Would you like to field any questions? If you guys have any questions, you guys are all ready to go out there and do it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can you send us an email with the links you mentioned and with the um, um, bills? Let me write this down. Okay. Who shall I send it to, Carrie? Yes, I'll get it distributed. I have a question, Michelle. Yeah. Yes. The audio was a little bit, I mean, we could hear you, but for a tape recording, um, we, we would warn uh -huh. that better quality audio. So can we retake this at some point so that we can make a uh, make an, uh, make a uh, a video? Yes. Yeah, that, that, that'd be that would be good. Okay. So we'll arrange to, to retake so that we can have a better uh, uh, audio and she, she might wanna you might wanna invest or give us the receipt or whatever so that your ability to transmit your audio is of uh, great quality. I'm sorry, say again I my the, the audio coming in is really bad too. The audio something made we need to figure out what made the thing what made the uh, transmission drag. It dragged a little bit because when okay. things we want the highest quality. So why don't we get okay. and buy it Okay, but I'm letting him problem solve. We have here a good connection, not wireless. I don't know anything. I don't want to know anything about it. I just think like let's tell Stephen. We're having this problem. We don't have a good connection. We can figure it out. The connection that yeah. this that's his job, you know. Uh, he's not here, so. No, I don't mean this minute, but we can also ask him to be on a night pause if we arrange it. So we do want to re 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 uh re redo so we can have a better recording, okay? Okay. Not right now, though, right? No, no, no not right now. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> Just let me know. What do you think about What's that? the call for the, uh, what are they calling for? The call for the strike on Wednesday. What do you think about that? You know, I, I kind of have mixed feelings about it. I feel like it, I mean, I, I think it'll be good. It'll be interesting to see, you know, how many show up. I feel like having it so close to the other one is give people kind of march fatigue. I mean, I think it's, the date is really significant, but, um, you know, calling something a strike without getting labor involved first is always a little iffy. And a lot of women have already said, you know, I can't leave work without, you know, something happening to me. So sometimes this stuff comes out of the ultra left and they think everyone's just going to like lay down their tools and, you know, rawr, run out into the street. And they do have other ways you can participate. You know, you can make a sign or wear a shirt and um, I have to work so I'm going to be wearing a shirt. But um, I, I kind of hope they're not just going to be doing a march every three months and then coming out with this kind of nebulous list of like things you can do because after the last women's march, which was so awesome, you know, I look, kind of looked around for a program for things that people do, and they're kind of like, well, you can download this app, you can make posters, you can support Planned Parenthood, and da da da. They're kind of like, you know, we, re we really need something that's like a substantial plan, you know, maybe not my plan, but a plan that people can, you know, sign on to and say, you know, this is, this is what's next, you know, I'm just afraid that people are just going to keep marching every three months and that there's not going to be a program. So I, I guess I'm just kind of like, back and forth on it. Um, that's my feelings. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, does anyone else have any questions? Uh. <laughs> So we'd like to thank you, Michelle, and we'll be in touch about re uh, right. doing the recording. All right. Thank you, everybody, and thanks for your patience with my technical fumbling. All right. Love you guys. Have a good night. Thank you, you too. All right. All right.